this is the topic. I bring the, bring the topic of user intent uh, that comes accompanied by a number of important questions. Uh, user intent uh, within, of course, the context of digital products, is it something that we can measure? I will try to answer this question. Is it something that we are entitled to know with certainty enough to engineer products that propound or propel themselves as capable of uncovering intent? capable of predicting intent. So user intent, our ability to measure it, intent to measure ability, and our ability to engineer products uh, that leverage on whatever interpretation we make of intentionality. Now, I don't have slides, so uh, bear with me. But I do have two clear objectives that I hope to meet uh, today. The first objective is that I would like us to be open to expand the considered view of what user intent is. And by the considered view, I mean the objective knowledge within our digital industry as per what is user intent when we speak of it. And when we use it in our definitions, expectations, when we think of it, the way we see it. So the first objective is to expand, to open up the idea of what user intent is and incorporate within it more than that, which we can infer, more than that, what we can, that we can extract from given data. I'll get back to that uh, important uh, objective, of course, in a moment. And the second objective, I would like us to take on this expanded view of what intent may be and incorporate it into alternative ways, rather mindsets in the engineering, in the creation, in the making of digital products of whatever kind. So those are the two objectives, to challenge the way we see user intentionality nowadays in our industry, and to take that constructive uh, expansion into the way we think of digital products. And I do believe that the best way to frame this is to provide a very simple trajectory of steps a very simple story that is reflective and hopefully articulates what we mean, uh, how we frame the notion of intentionality. You know, it, it is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in London here, is, is of course uh, evening time, uh, in the collection of time zones that I've seen uh, people are, uh, but imagine the following example applied to you, please. Imagine that you are extremely hungry and thirsty and driven by that craving, you move into action and decide to order some food. I move into intention. And you decide to open whatever is your delivery app. Doesn't matter which one it is. And to simplify, in this example, picture that you have three options. I'm sure I'm not going to accommodate everybody's uh, food interests, but let me picture those three options. One is burgers. Another one is, goodness, I'm hungry as I'm saying this. Another one is pizza. And another one is sushi. And then and there, you act by following the pizza option. Within the pizza option, you're presented with a number of restaurants, pizza places, sorted by the proximity to your postcode. You select one. Inside the menu, you select a pizza 
Caprichosa, scroll down, drinks, beers, you add one beer, couple of seconds after you decide to add another one, and that's it. Intent in action is completed, order is completed, and you check out. So that trajectory I followed can help us to frame the way we understand using intentionality today. And if you ask yourself this very simple yet very profound question, what were the reasons and what were the causes, which is in essence why, which is in essence intent, behind the choices that you made? What were the reasons and what were the causes? If you think of those reasons and causes from the considered opinion, the objective knowledge, the way we think or see of it within our digital industry, there is a lot of certainty. We know categorically in deterministic form that intentionality is articulated by a sequence of events. That's the way we speak of it, that's the way we think of it, that's the way we compute it. C came to happen because of B that was attributed to A. A time sequence of events or sequences of events, rectilinear causal flow. Now, we see this flattened interpretation of what user intent is because it's incredibly useful and it provides us with guidelines. It gives us facts as opposed to generalizations. It's reassuring. We take passively the knowledge contained in the data traceability of what an intent is. And it is a very comfortable space to use as a beacon, as a building block in your decisions, in your data-driven decisions as per, does this work or it does not? Is this attributable? To what extent? To what degree? And this interpretation of using intentionality, it serves those two counts, really. You know, I'm able to know what's happening, I'm able to report on the way users are interacting with my digital product of whatever kind, and of course, and subsequently, I'm able to act on it. Whatever automation within the realm of advanced information processing, evaluation, judgments, lots of the things that we've been discussing here, uh, intense anticipation, clustering, uh, whatever you like to do, tests, uh, whatever you like to do that as an outcome and subsequently you bring back to the understanding and measurement to qualify and attribute with value those automated actions. So it's all very resolved and very well defined. And that's the way we have decided to define user intent today in our industry. Now, if you ponder this for a moment and try to challenge the way we see this, because by us taking a definition of using intentionality as a sequence of events that operate unmysteriously, we are objectifying the very notion of intent to the qualities, by objectification I mean, the qualities of a subject, an individual, yourself, myself, anybody here, to the qualities of an object. As a matter of fact, a lifeless object that operates and mysteriously. And we just take this for granted. We don't run an intellectual exercise. We take it passively. We build it into our interpretations. We use it as a beacon of direction. And of course, this is my opinion. I do believe that some of the less ethical products that there are begin on this simplification and this interpretation of human intentionality. You know, it is inadequate quantitatively inadequate. It is qualitatively inadequate, not to mention ethically, of course. 
we objectify the subject. Now, if you come back to the question of what were the reasons and causes behind the choices that you have made when you were selecting those particular items, if you go back to answer this question, this time put aside the collective knowledge, the considered objective knowledge, which of course is incredibly useful, and we need that objectivity to move forward. But just put it aside for a moment and look at your subjective interpretation. Why did you select pizza on the first place? Well, was it because of the arrangements of those objects in that particular structure, in that state, in that object, which was the app itself? Or was it because you wanted to, as yourself, each of us has their own reasons and causes, because you felt, you know, celebratory, or you wanted to recall a memory? Did you add a second beer because it was part if there was to be a prize bundle, or did you do it because you didn't want to share your beer with your partner, you wanted her or him to have his own beer? Did you select a restaurant that was in close proximity because you thought in terms of the efficiency of the transaction, or were you inclined not to put your money on a chain or to help somebody who you knew or your community? I mean, if you think about the reasons and the causes behind the choices that you make in the interaction with any digital product of whatever kind, those reasons fall in the realm inevitably of the thought and feeling process of choices, which is not sequential in nature, it's concurrent and concentric. Not because we are going to flatten user intentionality to a mechanical interpretation. We are going to come and accommodate the understanding of what it is and what it means. So why do we do this? And what can we do about this? Why, on the first place, we accept that that which is not available through data doesn't exist. And we just go on as if nothing happens. You know, the very subjectivity, the very notion, truthfully, of what intentionality entitles. If it's not in data, I consider that it's unimportant. If I don't see it in the traceability, I consider that it doesn't exist. I take a passive role. I'm not going to think of it. It doesn't exist. I don't see it. Now, we must challenge this. We must challenge this. And what I find, and hopefully you do find particularly interesting, is that not only we are flattening the very nature of user intentionality to a causal linear sequence, but then we go on and propagate in our all digital endeavors, and we all go on and believe that this is with certainty what is happening, and we exclude the very notions of subjectivity, momentary uh, uh, contextualizations, uh, concurrency of thoughts, emotions, and feelings, uh, parallelism and multifaceted choices, and the whole complexities of human behavior, not only we do that to uh, uh, flatten all this in, in such exercise of simplification, uh, to be able to engineer a product, we actually do it. The intention behind our very simplification of user intentionality is a goddamn feeling. We decide to ignore the feelings of our users because we don't feel comfortable with ambiguity. Nobody does. You don't feel that you're doing your bit to the intellectual exercise of engineering a product if you don't put things in places, in boxes, if you don't catalog individuals, which is obscene when you think about it. We resource to a simplification of human intentionality because it's not desirable, it's not comfortable to deal with chaos. Nobody likes to sit in front of a table that is in this array. Nobody likes to open a wardrobe. Well, some people might, but generally speaking, we like to see our inbox or slacks or things in order. So it's because of that desire of having things in places that we decide 
to ignore human intentionality and flatten it. And then go on and speak and think that we can create products than predict it. I mean, some of these endeavors that resulted, some of these horrible things that we see in social media, in MarTech, ad tech, even in commerce, not to mention in health, finance, insurance, that elude the consideration of what an individual is just because that consideration is not traceable in data. Right? So what do we do about this? What do we do about this? Well, I propose the following. First of all, to be open to bringing to your mindset that there isn't absolute certainty in the measurement or interpretation of using intentionality. There are mere approximations. This will start to flavor in the present time. Second of all, and this is something that I am trying to do, I don't hold the quality of this wise capacity, I'm trying to do this. Try to feel comfortable by processing this ambiguity. You know, we might believe that we have a report that explicitly articulates a notion of intentionality, but we have to also accept that there is some truth only in it. And there are a whole wealth of emotions, effects, feelings, thought processes that are incredibly relevant to the representation of what those intents are that we are unable to know. So we need to exercise this acceptance, this embracement of ambiguity, of not knowing in the way we engineer our products. So the first recommendation is to be at ease in the uncomfortableness of something that is chaotic or that is ambiguous and embrace that. Right. If we try to exercise that, we can start to work on the culture of our teams, on the way, you know, culture can be anything, but on the way we try to understand the way we try to understand perhaps the most important thing that we have to deal with in our everyday endeavors within the digital making, which is the individuals that we serve. Perhaps we have to reconsider the notion of what a user is and try to abstract from that simplicity and not to be afraid of incorporating unknowns, mysterious qualities and the mind which remains to be in many ways, is still unknown. Build that culture within your company, that metrics, that metrics are angles, points of view, circumstantial. This categorical interpretation of what works and what doesn't eludes so much of what is within that which you're trying to measure. Of course, I'm talking about the measurability of individuals and individuals' interactions, not that of systems. And lastly, set your objectives as the elicitation, the evoking of emotions. Why not? You might arrive at creating your, your delivery app in a way that is talking that language, that rather than being so obsessed with trying to uncover what an intent is, it is preoccupied with trying to land the potential feelings that that person might have. You don't have to know that that person feels in a certain way or aspires to feel that something is trusted, that something has to be aesthetic, that something has to be understandable, that something has to deliver intuition. You don't have to know those things to try to deliver to those things. In fact, some of the most successful products that they are exhibit that quality. So those are the two objectives I have, and I wanted to save this time for questions. Let's challenge the way we at our industry think and see and speak about user intentionality. User intent is not something that we know. Predicting user intent is not something that we can propel. You know, there is a lot more than we can see in data. By narrowing down, it's great, gives you clarity, 
But the more you narrow down to that which you can trace from data, you have to assume there is so much that you're leaving outside. And then if you start to consider this open, expanded view of what intent is, think of alternative ways. And that very thinking brings you to a particular mindset that incorporates ambiguity and chaos in the interpretation of what works and what doesn't. And just feel comfortable with it. So uh, I'll be happy to hear questions if possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you, Angel. Can you hear me okay? Can I hear you perfectly well? Awesome. Uh, I haven't seen any questions come through yet, um, but I had a I had a question for you. Um, this came up. I, I I felt like the way you started to talk, it came up for me in real life like a week ago. We were out uh, visiting the Capitol, and I was using Yelp. And instead of guessing intent, they have this mechanism by which you kind of almost select some pre-bucketed intents for them, like open now. Like I'm looking for hamburgers or food that's open now. And you kind of, I, I wanted to use the phrase opt in to intent. Um, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on how we can still take advantage of some of the stuff we know about user bases and kind of marketing personas, all that other stuff that goes along with business. Um, yeah, just your your thoughts on kind of opting in or giving people options to get into one of those intenty search funnels, maybe. Yes, that's the direction that these are going. And there are important clues that signify this direction. And many companies have started to exercise some of these uh, explicit, explicitly based or explicit action or first party uh, exercise, mm. as opposed to behind the scenes trying to uh, influence, uncover, detect, interpret. So an, an open, transparent, uh, mutually benefit uh, conversation. Uh, that is very encouraging and, and it is happening. Uh, you see this exercise uh, across the board. Uh, it is a very sensitive topic to provoke uh, that creepy feeling with, when these uh, intent interpretations come your way. And we were exposed to these all the time still today and, and to the most uh, ridiculously endeavor uh, uh, unethical approaches uh, to these. But the current has changed. This is uh, evident and, and it is very encouraging. First of all, because we want to dedicate our time when we are developing our digital products and uh, whatever is your field to things that are uh, trustworthy to things that are fair, to things that are sustainable, to things that are ethical, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we do have two two questions that I want to make sure we have time for. So we have five minutes. Uh, so the, the question that's in the lead right now is, can you give an exam a real world example, uh, a client or someone uh, of adopting this mindset? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I believe Companies like DuckDuckGo, like Apple, are perfect examples of this approach. Uh, as you know, the, you know, for example, it's fresh and fresh news. iOS 15, still not here, uh, update, uh, has made a massive, massive epic change by blocking their very Siri technology from uh, communicating to their central states. You know, voice has been always a tricky topic in voice interactions. Voice itself is an incredibly loyal representation of an identity. Uh, by trying to build mappings, vectorial or whatever form from our voice patterns, we are indeed trying to build an intent interpretation. But what Apple has done is fundamentally architecturally change this. And now in iOS 15, voice is processed in your device. So, you know, technologies like TinyML that we use extensively, technologies that use in the local first processing are perfect examples of this utilization of intentionality outside of the sphere of control of the brand or the maker of the product and within the sphere of privacy of the individual. Other companies like DuckDuckGo shortcut this whole endeavor by not doing 
as opposed to doing it differently. There is no traceability or intentionality calculation. There is no productization of the events, but just as it is a query, full stop. So I don't have a question that I don't know if that helps. I think it, I think it does it help me for sure. Um, the second question that's waiting uh, for your answer is what kind of kickstarted you and made you start to think about the importance of uh, this emotions and at least in terms of the search context world? Does that make sense? What we'll kickstarted yes, this course. journey for you? Yes, of course, of course. Well, can I speak the truth uh, as it is? Um, I always been incredibly passionate about why uh, things work in certain way, why we feel in certain way. Um, uh, and I've always been curious about this. I, uh, you know, although I'm a computer scientist and, and I devote my, my career to this, I'm, I'm passionate about uh, psychology, neurobiology, neuroscience, of course, philosophy. So I've always been investigating this. Uh, and the whole notion of intentionality I have researched it in many, from many different angles, uh, linguistically, uh, psychologically, neuropsychologically, uh, philosophically. Elizabeth Anscombe has a very good introduction to this concept. Uh, so why I was always passionate of this is because I believe this got to be another kind of advancement uh, to the mere functioning of things. And I believe that the products, the companies, the cultures, the, the, the individuals, the places, the innovations that we love, it's not just because of what they do rationally, but the way they make us feel. And it seems that we don't work on that. We just focus on the rationale. Of course, it makes us and keeps us busy, but I believe the distinction and the success in its full splendor happens when you manage to relate emotionally. Well said. Let me just do one final check and make sure I didn't leave anyone's questions hanging. And good thing I did. There's one more that I think we can squeeze in. We have less than a minute, uh, but we have a little bit of a gap between the next talk. Do you feel that building intent recognition in commercial systems and ethics slash human humanism uh, can coexist? Can they go together? They, they have to. Uh, people who know me, uh, they, they say that I, uh, I'm always challenging uh, the mere uh, rationale to be able to create products, et cetera. Uh, the truth is that I, I, I don't believe it in absolute certainty. Uh, but there is a tension that we need to create between uh, the emotional and the rational. Think of it as a string that is in tension. You, know, you have to make those advancements in, in, in inference, mathematically, probabilistically, linguistically. Uh, but you have to keep that in the right balance with the tension of an emotional interpretation, a psychological, humanistic. Uh, two opposites that uh, need each other. Uh, so the tension is required. What's happening is that we are too focused on the mechanical, rational interpretation, and we need to give a little bit more attention to the emotional side of things. And be critic with our work. And just not don't take things passively as what they are in data. Take an active role. Bottom line, right? And there is one more question that slipped in while you're, while you're answering that question is how much weight would you place in an experience? Uh, how much weight would you place between experience versus relevancy in, in a search project? It depends on the, on the industry. And oh, this is such an important question. But subjectivity in commerce, you know, you don't buy things because you need them. You buy them in a spare part for your fridge because you want to feel useful in your household. It all comes down to emotions. In the world of commerce, it's different than in a world of legal research or medical. So the balance of the experience versus the relevancy is inevitably, as you very well know, those who are versed in search uh, in the domain that you are uh, operating. I'm sorry, I'm not giving you a much better answer, but uh, I understand there is not, not much time. 